Let us pray. Withdraw not your mercy from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth always preserve me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is a story of an old man who used to meditate early every morning under a big tree in the bank of the Ganges River. One morning, after he had finished his meditation, the old man opened his eyes and saw a scorpion floating helplessly in the water. As the scorpion was washed closer to the tree, the old man quickly stretched himself out on one of the long roots that branched out into the river and reached out to rescue the drowning creature. As soon as he touched it, the scorpion stung him. Instinctively, the man withdrew his hand. A minute later, after he'd regained his balance, he stretched himself out again on the roots to save the scorpion. This time, the scorpion stung him so badly with its poisonous tail that his hand became swollen and bloody and his face contorted in pain. At that moment, a passerby saw the old man stretched out on the roots, struggling with the scorpion, and shouted, Hey, stupid old man, what's wrong with you? Only a fool would risk his life for the sake of an ugly, evil creature. Don't you know you could kill yourself trying to save that ungrateful scorpion? The old man turned his head, looking into the stranger's eyes, He said calmly, My friend, just because it's the scorpion's nature to sting, that does not change my nature to love. Sitting here at the typewriter in my study, I turned the symbol of the crucified Christ on the wall to my left, and I hear Jesus praying for his murderers, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. The scorpion he had tried to save finally killed him. To the passerby who sees him stretched out on the tree roots and who shouts only a madman would risk his life for the sake of an ugly, ungrateful creature, I hear Jesus' answer. My friend, just because it is a fallen mankind's nature to wound, that does not change my nature. To save. Who for us in our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. You no doubt are familiar with those lines of the creed, if not the story that I just read to you. But did you ever find yourself asking, why? Why did God come down? Why did God choose to suffer and die? Was it necessary? Many people now ask that question. Increasingly, people who would identify themselves as Christians or at least having grown up in the church ask it too. Perhaps even you've done so. At Christmas, we focus on the mystery of the Incarnation. The idea that God and the person of Jesus chose to become man, assuming a body, and became one of us. Why did he come down? It is is his nature to save, is the answer. Last night, we meditated on the importance of the body and how our adversary, Satan, is constantly trying to drive a wedge between the body and the spirit throughout history. Satan has often had success confusing humanity, even within the church, to pit the body against the spirit. God chose to take on a body, however, and the nature of man in order to be crucified as someone fully God and fully man. Several authors have characterized Jesus' crucifixion on the cross as, quote, cosmic child abuse, 
Perhaps you've heard that term. But the idea that the Father sent His Son to earth just to torture Him and kill Him is not the witness of Scripture. The question is absurd if we consider that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are indeed one in substance, though three in persons. Unlike Abraham and Isaac in our Genesis reading, Jesus and the Father are one. God is both persons. One person sent his Son, and the other chose to come down and save us. For us and for our salvation, He came down. For our sake, He was crucified. For the ancient faith, God's descent to earth and the crucifixion, those two things cannot be separated. They're part of one whole. Many with good intentions have reduced the gospel to this. To satisfy God, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Perhaps you've heard that. Perhaps you've even said it. I know I have. It's not untrue, but it's incomplete. It gives no greater context and risks distorting rather than uncovering the real Jesus who was the willing provision of the Father who chose to come down. The Father gave him the Father gave him to the world to take on the wrath of the wrath of sin. But the Father was not pouring vengeance on an innocent son. That's not the point of the gospel. The church calendar and Holy Week services the creeds themselves and the collect today all stand as a bulwark against that reductionistic gospel and insist on putting us into the proper context of what God is doing with his plan of salvation. That it's God's nature to save, that God the Father provided his Son, and that God the Son chose to give himself. We know from Scripture that God is good. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34 says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. The Psalms are full of references to His goodness, and most importantly, Jesus tells us Himself that God is good, so much so that even good humans are evil compared to God. Jesus says in the Gospels, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask Him? As a Father, God provides. As a Son, God in Jesus is obedient and honoring to the Father. That relationship is key. But both persons are God. On Good Friday, God has both provided Himself as the perfect Father and provided Himself willingly as the perfect Son. Both in Genesis chapters 22 and Hebrews chapter 10, those passages show God's provision. In Genesis 22, God shows Abraham that those that through sacri those sacrifices required due to sinful disobedience, unlike the nations around Abraham, God does not further harm His creation by requiring child sacrifice because He alone is good. And look what Abraham calls the place where this incident happened. If you have your bulletins, you can turn to it with me. Verse 14 so Abraham called the name of that place, what? The Lord will provide. And as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. God has provided. Then if we look to the Hebrews reading, 
from chapter 10, particularly verses 5 through 7, we see that God provides again Himself as a human being with a body prepared, and God again takes this gift and obeys and honors His Father. Remember, both are God. Read with me again Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, and then 12 through 14. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And jumping down to verse 12, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Since the time of Adam and Eve and the subsequent first sins of rebellion, all we have gone astray. All we, sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, owe God an immense debt. But the enemy of man, Satan, and his minions have also added to our burden, taking advantage of that fallen nature and using it against us. It's these enemies' efforts, combined with the sinfulness of man, that tormented and crucified Jesus. Oh yes, God permitted it. But this was not God's violent vengeance poured out upon Jesus. God chose to become a man in order to die upon the cross. Jesus Christ incarnate is both provision of the Father and the choice of the Son. All that applies to the Son applies to the Father. And even this, God has provided. This is what the great hymn in Philippians 2 proclaims, that Jesus emptied himself, not by force, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Was Jesus' death necessary? Why? Why must he suffer and die for us? It's a legitimate question, and as I said earlier, is becoming more pre- prevalent, even among those who attend church. But sinful human beings like to think that we can atone. We think that we can pay for our own sins. We think that somehow we can make good on our rebellion against God by doing better next time. But dear friends, you owe God total obedience, total devotion, total love. And because of that, it's just a matter of logic that you can never regain that righteousness. It's just a matter of mathematics, if you will. You owe him 100%, which the Bible calls justice, as well as a righteous heart. And no one of us can say, and no one in the world can say, I've given God 100%. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, as Isaiah 53 tells us. But God is good. And that goodness, in that goodness, is both justice and love. Justice means that God cannot ignore sin. And trust me, friends, you wouldn't want him to. Because God is just, he must vindicate injustice. Another way of saying it is that he must stop the evil that results from injustice. When a human being breaks justice, he not only breaks himself, but his unjust act ripples out. There's no private sin. Theologian Francis Hall writes, the attitude which lies behind the demand of divine love that human sin shall not prevent its consummation 
is called the wrath of God. It's not vindictive, not malicious or contrary to love, but is the inevitable form which righteous love assumes in the presence of interference with its requirements. But you see, God's wrath is the result of his love and the result of our unrighteousness and sin. If God did not vindicate injustice, the entire universe would collapse in upon itself. All order would be destroyed. And indeed, that's the trajectory we were on. But then God intervened. He could have destroyed the human race. He had every right to. Throughout the Old Testament, God comes to the brink of destroying humanity for its rebellion. But he does not. Think about it. Why? Why not? Well, as we're about to sing, love. Love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be, as the next hymn so declares. Love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. Justice in God's creation needed to be restored. Sin and Satan needed to be stopped. And God desired to save you and me to have a relationship with us once again. For our sake and our salvation, He came down. For our sake, He was crucified. God so loved the world that He sent His Son. God said, Be it done according to Thy will. Why? He is good. And though it is our nature to bruise and kill and sting and mock, it is His nature to save. Let us marvel at that mystery of love. <laughs>